the the female's fertilized, um, she deposits eggs into a pouch mm. that is formed of plates, and the plates are called ustegites. And um, it, together, and it, as a structure, they're called a marsupium, a pouch. And the eggs are in there in a very moist environment, and they develop over the process of several weeks. And that uh, how long that exactly takes uh, depends on the species and so on. And, um, and she, she's carrying that around, right? That's on, on, on her belly. Right. That's on her belly, attached to her belly. Basically, the pouch, pouch is part of her body. And um, once she gets to a certain point, um, she will release the offspring. And it appears that some species, in some species, she might release the offspring. They might actually go back into the pouch um, for a short period of time and then come back out. There is some parental care in isopods, and it varies widely in species. Some of the females will protect the young for long periods of time, several days, maybe several weeks, and some even longer. Uh, the, that desert species, the Hemelopistes reamari that I mentioned before, it appears that the male and female will actually take turns foraging and then protecting the young and, and bringing incredible. food back for the young and different things. So, um, But many species just sort of, they come out of the pouch and they're gone and that's it and they're done. They go fend for themselves. And a lot of the ones in the hobby are like that. Welcome back to the Animals at Home podcast. My name is Dylan Parent, and thank you so much for tuning in today. Today, I'm speaking with Russ Wilson of Aquarimax Pets on YouTube. If you're not familiar with Russ and his YouTube channel, you should be. But if you're not, his channel is mostly focused on fish keeping, isopod keeping, and other inverts, as well as reptiles. And my favorite part about Russ's channel is A, it's starting to take off. He's hit 60,000 subscribers, which is incredible. But B, all of his content seems to be influenced by a single source, and that is his own interest. There's nothing about Russ's channel that seems like he's, you know, chasing down different rabbit holes in order to garner views by, you know, chasing popular species and whatnot. It just seems like everything featured on his channel are just things that he's incredibly interested in, and it just makes it so interesting for the viewers to follow that path. And because of that, he's become one of the most prolific channels on YouTube when it comes to isopods. Now, of course, there's a massive crossover between reptile keeping and invert keeping, and I isopods is really like the middle of that Venn diagram because they serve so many different purposes in our hobby and in our community. So in this episode, we spend a ton of time talking about them. We talk about their natural history, their evolution. We discuss the best species for display enclosures, for using them as feeders for your reptiles, for bioactive setups, whether that's arid or tropical setups. We talk about their natural history or sorry, their, their life cycle and how to create thriving breeding colonies. We also cover some of the other animals that Russ keeps that he finds that are completely underrated in our keeping community, especially the garter snakes. We have a, a nice conversation about garter snakes as well. And I think that's, um, we talk about a lot more, but I think I'll leave the rest for the episode. If you are looking for more information on this podcast, make sure you head to animalsathomenetwork.com. There you can find the show notes and all the links to all the things that Russ has mentioned within this episode. If you would like to join us over on Patreon, you can do that at patreon.com slash animals at home. We are super close to hitting a hundred patrons, which would be amazing to hit. I, I'm happy and grateful for everyone that has decided to join that group over there. And if you are interested in helping support the podcast financially, that is really the best way you can do that. Thank you so much to Custom Reptile Habitats for sponsoring this episode of the podcast. You can find affiliate links in both the YouTube description and the show notes. And again, if you are just enjoying the podcast, the best thing you can do is just share it on social media, Instagram or Facebook. That really does help get our show on more ears and eyes. And I think we'll jump into this episode. Enjoy. Well, Russ, welcome to the podcast. Thank you for doing this. Yeah, thank you for having me. I've been excited looking forward to this. Yeah, you're absolutely somebody who's been requested several times by the listeners. So I'm fine. I'm glad that we're uh, able to put this together. I I'm, I'm very curious about your animal keeping history because you do keep a lot and you have a, a very interesting resource on YouTube just for, you know, more uncommon things, specifically isopods and inverts and whatnot. But did you start with fish or what got you into keeping it originally? Well, I've... I guess as far as my YouTube channel and the podcast that I that I used to do, uh, it was focused on aquatics, uh, fish and aquatic invertebrates. But I've always been interested in everything, and I've kept everything. Well, not everything, obviously, but I've kept a lot of different things, a wide variety of creatures, reptiles, amphibians, inverts, fish, mammals, birds, just lots of different things. Uh, so years and years ago, I was... Uh, I bred sugar gliders, for example, like 
20 something years ago. Oh, wow. And um, I, I had leopard geckos back then and um, anoles and uh, triops and uh, fish and, and different things. Uh, as a kid, I was, you know, the, like so many of us, I was out herping and bringing things home and um, catching larval salamanders and watching them develop, finding frog eggs and letting them grow up and that kind of thing. I was doing that ever since I was just a little kid. So I've always, always been, been into there. all of it, really. Yeah, and, yeah. Um, I think uh, I started out with fish uh, on my podcast and then subsequently my YouTube channel because I lived in Hawaii for a few years. We lived in an apartment complex where they said you can have fish and birds and that's it. And so we had fish and birds, fish yeah. and a, a bird. And then when we came back, I was still just kind of on that track. That's what I had when I came back. And so I started there, but um, I've always had interest in, in the rest of it. So uh, I eventually branched out. It, it was yeah. more... Um, my channel is going to reflect more of what I am already doing, already interested in than it did before. Right. Yeah. Cause it really does seem like you have quite a spectrum of things. And, and when, when I look at you, what, what you keep, you know, obviously the fish is a, a staple and, and it's, but also you have, you know, it's like, like many of us, we're interested in many different species. The fish world and the reptile world really do cross over quite a lot. It, can you just give everybody just a brief, you know, you don't have to go through everything, but just a kind of a, a picture of what you're, what you do have right now. Okay. Yeah. Aquatically, I think I have about 10 tanks. Um, I've got one fairly large tank with a couple of goldfish and and some uh, bristlenose placos and several types of snails. And that's a planted tank uh, with plant, uh, plants that do well with goldfish. But I have uh, a tank that for blue star endlers, uh, similar to guppies, very bright blue fish. I've got, I recently had, recently sold a tank of uh, Tanganyikan shell dwelling cichlids because um, I was moving on to some other projects. But I had that for quite a long time and enjoyed that. And um, we have an axolotl. We have uh, various types of shrimp. I have some Hawaiian uh, opaiula shrimp, for example, several tanks with those in them. Uh, I've got a tank right here next to me where we're growing Daphnia. So that gives you an idea of some of my aquatic things. It's not all of it, but that's, it gives you an idea. And then uh, reptile-wise, we have several geckos. I breed morning geckos because if you keep morning geckos, you breed morning geckos by <laughs> default, yeah. of course. Um, we have several uh, crested geckos. We've got... Uh, morning gecko. And then I breed garter snakes, I have red sided garter snakes, uh, prairie, uh, plains garter snakes, and uh, now some melanistic Eastern garter snakes. And so I've been breeding the red sided for a few seasons now and uh, am planning on breeding the melanistics in about a year. And uh, that's what we've got for reptiles. Frog wise, I have a trio of bumblebee dart frogs. Uh, my daughter has um, a Pac-Man frog, and then I, I mentioned my other child has an axolotl, and we have a corn snake, and we've got three chickens in the backyard, a couple of cats, and then a huge assortment of invertebrates <laughs> of various types, from centipedes and a few scorpions to um, harvestmen, and about 80-something different types of isopods, and uh, some millipedes, and spiders of a few different types, lots of things. Yeah, it, it's really probably one of the more diverse collection of animals out there just due to the fact that you keep a lot of small things. So you can, you know, like you said, 80 different species of isopods, for example. There's not very many people that have 80 species of anything. Have you always focused on things that were smaller? Even, even in the fish aquatic size, it seems like most of the things you're keeping are, are relatively small. I think I, I have had a tendency to do that, uh, partly just for space. You know, mm -hmm. most of my isopods fit in a walk-in closet. Um, and I should clarify that there are about 80 different types. When I say types, I'm including some morphs and localities in there. So not all of those are species sure. differences, but you know, 80 plus different recognizable types of isopods, if we put it that way. Um, but yeah, um, I think I have had a tendency to do that. Uh, partly for that uh, reason, I can provide a pretty good complex uh, enriched environment to a trio of garter snakes in a 40 gallon tank. And I couldn't do that with a much larger species, you know, things like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. That makes a lot of sense. And so, so tell me about the isopod passion, because this is something that's relatively recent. I feel like as far as, you know, in reptile keeping world and even just, you know, just exotic keeping world in the last maybe like five or six years, and, and you've really taken it to another level. So do, when, when were you first introduced to isopods? I was keeping aquatic isopods and breeding them when I was about 13 years old. Okay. And so we're talking more than 30 years, not to age myself too much, but it's 
It was, it was more than 30 years ago when I was keeping isopods in a 10 gallon aquarium, found some of them in a local uh, irrigation canal, brought them home and uh, put them in a fish tank, which didn't have any fish in it yet. And uh, they ended up breeding. And I thought this is fantastic. And then I ended up putting some newts in there. And that was the end of the isopods at the time. <laughs> you know, when you're 13 or so years old, things like that happen. And uh, then it was uh, a number of years later. And I, I'm sure I do remember putting iso, you know, terrestrial isopods in jars and feeding them and observing them and stuff like that um, after that. But it wasn't until much later, maybe around uh, early 2000s, when I started keeping marine aquaria, which I, I don't have any true marine aquaria right now, but I did. Uh, when I lived in Hawaii, I started um, keeping marine aquaria and had isopods. Uh, in the marine aquarium. But then um, when I started with terrestrialized pods, that was approximately 10 years ago. And, you know, give or take, something like that. Uh, I was keeping them... Well, I, I started finding out about bioactives. I was doing research on bioactives because I thought they were fascinating and uh, realized, oh, isopods are, are a really important part of how these bioactive enclosures can work, uh, at least certain types of them. And so I went to a local dart frogger and picked up three different species of isopods. I think I got uh, Porcelio scaber orange and the dwarf whites that everybody's pretty familiar with. They're in, you know, like an amphibian or reptile hobby. And I think it was the dwarf purples at the time. And at first I was just thinking them mostly as bioactive cleanup crew. That's what they're for. But I realized that there's a fascination to the isopods themselves and to raising them, watching them thrive and, uh, then I, I met other people who would say, hey, I got this new kind of isopod. Do you want some of those? Let's trade for this and that. And it just sort of blossomed from there. Yeah. Well, I, I remember sort of first coming across them as well, just sort of the same reason, you know, when bioactive setups and whatnot. And I, I originally I was kind of creeped up by them. I'm, I don't know why they just kind of creeped me out. But then as I started keeping them myself in bioactive enclosures and also starting to keep my own little colonies, it, it does become fascination, fa fascinating and you want to help them thrive and figure out what makes them work. And then so maybe you could just give us a little, you know, you already said you keep different, almost 80 different types of isopods, but what are some of the, the, the species that you keep? And, and I'm also curious about some of the, the native ranges of some of these. So maybe we just start with the species and then I'll get into some, some other questions. There's a wide variety, but I tend to have a lot of species from the genus Porcelio, including some of the more common ones like Porcelio scaber that many people can find in their backyard, Porcelio labus, things like that. Mm -hmm. Um, and many of these are, uh, many of the Porcelio genus that we have in the hobby, um, whether they live in the United States or other parts of North America, uh, natively or not, there aren't very many that do that, that are in the hobby. Most of them live here um, now, but are not native. They're, they're originally from Europe and were introduced okay. here, um, but their, their native range is mostly in Europe. A lot of the big fancier Porcelio isopods like Porcelio expensis, um, Porcelio magnificus, we're talking like the the large ones that are an inch, an inch and a half, two inches long with long uropods and interesting colors and patterns, this kind of thing. Um, a lot of those are from Spain. Okay, interesting. Um, and it, it's actually fairly likely that we had a lot more isopod diversity in uh, North America until the last glaciation event sort of scraped them off the continent. <laughs> and right, yeah. since uh, Spain did, was not subject to the same sorts of pressures that they were able to evolve uh, there. And that's why they have such a a great diversity in places like Spain, other Mediterranean areas. And then there are other parts of the world too, like Southeast Asia is a good one for the Cubaris genus uh, and the Nezodilo genus and uh, so on. So things like rubber duckies, people think of all oh, the, the really crazy ones or the uh, Marulanellas, like the tricolors and things like that tend to come from Southeast Asia where a uh, glaciation event hasn't been an issue. And, um, and so they've had uh, a chance to evolve some really interesting uh, colors, patterns, and even, some of them have very exaggerated spikes and things like that uh, from that part of the world. Uh, and then uh, the Armadillidium genus, there's a lot more in Europe than there are here uh, in North America as well. And most of the ones we have here come from, come from Europe, but uh, we only have a couple of species that have uh, really populated North America. Well, in Europe, they have a wide variety of more colorful ones too. Right. I mean, it is pretty fascinating to think just how ancient this group of animals is on the planet, you know, the, and like you said, I mean, of course they originate from, from the ocean, but 
the fact that they were probably everywhere at one point on, on the earth and, you know, there's certain things that wiped them out, but it is millions and millions of years old and they're still trucking around. Right, right. And it's also amazing. And I know that Oren McMonagall mentions this in his book, um, Isopod Zoology, that one of the reasons that they are so successful on earth uh, in general, not just on land or not just in water and not just freshwater, not just saltwater, they're in all three. And there are thousands of species, you know, in the ocean, thousands of species on land and, and a good number of species in freshwater, hundreds at least, uh, is partly because they have this biphasic molting. You know, most arthropods, when they molt, have to molt out of their entire exoskeleton at once. They're extremely vulnerable because they're soft. They're not sclerotized yet. And so they have this period during which they're not mobile and they're very tasty and very soft. <laughs> right. And so um, isopods don't really go through that because they molt one half of their body at a time, you know, the front half or the back half. And when they do, even when their front legs are soft, their back legs are still mobile and they have enough of them, they can get around. And, and so that is one of the reasons that he postulates why isopods have so thoroughly um, colonized earth and freshwater and saltwater. You can't think of very many arthropod taxa that have done that to the extent isopods have. In some ways, they're kind of under the radar too, because if you ask the average mm -hmm. person about isopods, they have no clue what you're talking about. <laughs> True. And if you say roly-polies, oh yeah. Yeah, I mean, basement bugs. Yeah, those types of things. They, yeah. they are familiar with it. But, you know, compared to ants or something, like they are way more diverse and way more, they fulfill way wider ecological niche than, you know, more basic anthropod or arthropods that, that people are familiar with. Right, right. It's, it's interesting. And as far as, you know, the, the, the purpose that they serve on the planet, it's obviously a pretty functional purpose, decomposing matter and whatnot. I guess across the board, this is what they're doing in all, whether it's freshwater, ocean, or on land. Well, to a large extent, that's true. Um, many of the aquatic isopods are um, detritivores, just like the terrestrial ones tend to be. But there are some isopods that tend a little bit towards uh, predation. There are some that... Uh, in, in the marine environment specifically that are parasitic, some of them very mm -hmm. specialized predators are, are parasites, I mean. And so there are, there are some that are fulfilling different niches than uh, just to try divorce as well. Yeah, it's pretty fascinating. As far as uh, a species that you keep, do you have a favorite or is there just too many that you're fascinated with to, to pick? Um, I often say that my favorite is one I'm looking at right now um, <laughs> because they, they are just great. Um, and, and I do have a hard time picking one of my favorites, though, uh, is Armadillidium uh, gestroi. It is probably a Batesian mimic of a millipede with which it shares its range. Oh, cool. And so it doesn't have any sort of toxic um, secretion or anything, but the millipedes do. And it looks very similar to them with this vivid um, yellow spotting. And so it looks gorgeous, but you don't have to worry about any of the potential issues, you know, dealing with the toxin. And because it is uh, protected that way, it tends to be very bold and day active, unlike some isopods that, you know, hide and run when they are exposed to light or anything like that. And there are things you can do to kind of habituate isopods to light uh, to some extent, but these are naturally just bold. They get pretty large and they don't, they're fairly easy to breed, but they're not the sort that is so prolific that you're, what am I going to do with this? I have shoe boxes <laughs> yeah. stuffed full of ice. About. So it's, it's kind of a sweet spot, really. Mm. You've got color, you've got size, you've got boldness, and you've got uh, that place right in the middle between too prolific and not prolific enough. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think that's a good branch off. Because when I think about isopods, I think of them serving probably three different purposes. There's obviously, you know, keeping them as a display pet, which people are doing a lot more often now, you know, creating like a you know, actual little display for people. So maybe we could talk about that in a second. Also, yeah. the, the second would be the bioactive purpose. So, and we'll get into that too. And then the third, which is uh, one of my patrons brought up the other day, which I had only briefly thought about before, which was using them as feeders in the, in the reptile hobby. So I think that's another mm -hmm. really interesting area that people don't explore enough, but maybe we could start with display enclosures. Do you have any display enclosures for isopods? I do. Yeah, I have yeah. several. So uh, let's walk through that. Maybe, I mean, you'd already mentioned a species that would work well for that, but maybe if there's some mm -hmm. other species and then, and how are you setting them up? First of all, choosing a container is important. Uh, of course, you want one that has good clarity for a display enclosure mm. and you can use glass tanks. Some people do that. Um, I have tended not to use glass tanks uh, if the tank is purely for isopod display, partly because 
they can climb silicone a bit and they can do so, especially when it gets a little dirty. So right. I've tended to use more plastic containers that um, have corners that are a little bit easier to keep clean and don't have silicone for them to grip. Um, and they, you do need to wipe down the walls because even though isopods can't climb uh, clean, um, smooth plastic or glass, they can climb dirty glass or plastic and they can also climb, and it may not even look all that dirty, but if there are little particles adhering to it, they can climb that. They can also climb scratches. So right. you have to keep that in mind. Um, some enclosures that I've used, I'll go to like a hobby store and just pick up some display enclosures that are used for uh, model cars or for um, sports. Uh, like there's one I have that it's a basketball display case that works mm -hmm. really well. Um, there's some that are for model cars, different things like that. And just drill some ventilation holes in it. That works really well. Uh, usually on the uh, up, you know, get some cross ventilation up near the top and then some top ventilation as well. Um, I've also used, and I really like um, Tarantula Cribs. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you're familiar with the company, but they uh, they produce some great enclosures that are essentially escape proof for tarantulas, but they tend to be uh, really excellent for uh, isopods as well. And then uh, some others like uh, Microbarium is a company that produces display enclosures specifically for isopods. And they've sent me a couple of theirs to try oh, cool. out. And I really like theirs as well. And then what are some other species that you actually keep in them that you think act as, as decent display species? Okay. So in addition to Armadillidium gestroi, which I have on my desk at work, I have a, one of those and it's great because you always see them. Um, I have a, what I call the rainbow mix of Porcelia lavis. So it's Porcelia lavis orange, Porcelia lavis milkback, and some Porcelia lavis California mix. So these three will not interbreed. And um, I think the prevailing idea now is that they're all actually different species. They're cryptic species that have been misidentified as Porcelia lavis. And one of them is probably the California mix is, but the other two are not. There's not any really, or at least there's very little conclusive evidence that they can interbreed. And I've had all of these three together in an enclosure for couple of years now they're all breeding but there is no sign of interbreeding mm -hmm. between the three and because they are there's a lot of different colors and patterns you're getting with those three together and they have an insane feeding response it's an excellent display enclosure because you drop some food in there and you just get a swarm of oh, isopods all over the food and it's really cool the the gestroy are um, you know, they're willing to eat and they'll kind of mosey over. And it reminds me of kind of like some slow bison or something <laughs> going over to eat. But the, uh, the porcelain labus are like piranhas. They just run over the food and just rip at it until it's gone. And so it's really fun to, to watch them do that. I like that species for that reason, um, or that species complex or whatever's going on there. Um, another one, Porcelionides pruinosis has another, a lot of different color varieties you can get. They're smaller, but they also have a similar feeding response. Um, some other, uh, and one thing I wanted to mention about display that I think I hinted to earlier is that you can get a, a species that's fairly shy mm. and habituate it to, um, being in bright light over time. Um, some species will react better to that than others. Uh, some are really bad at it and you can keep them for months in a, in a brightly lit uh, area where they have a, a day night cycle and they'll just always come out at night. Uh, and then others that will habituate and just, no, oh, we don't care what time it is you're feeding us. We'll, we'll go, we'll go nuts. Um, so I think it's important to keep in mind, uh, that that is something you can do with some species, but other species, basically they're hardwired not to do that. And it's not going to help. Yeah. So you just notice over time with the bright lights, eventually you start seeing them out during the day and they just, they're, they don't care. They're rather just eat rather than hide during the, the day. Right. If, if it's one of those species that'll do that. Um, one of them is uh, like uh, the zebra ice pod, the Armadillidae maculatum. Yeah, They're yeah. a great display species. They might take a while to get used to the light, but they'll do it. But I have a container of Armadillidium maculatum, the zebras, and Armadillidium warneri, which I guess doesn't really have a common name. Uh, they're next to each other. And the Armadillidium warneri has been there for months, and they seem to almost always hide during the day but the maculatum are out all the time. Yeah. Well, and I think it's such a unique, as I had just recently, uh, when I was at an expo a couple months ago, I, there was a, there's a, 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 a couple here in, in where I live that 
has a bunch of isopods, very similar to you. They have tons of isopods, some that I've never seen before. So it's always a treat going to the expo, especially some of the larger species are just so mind blowing because you don't expect to see an isopod that large, like an inch long. And she was just saying how, how often she sells it to kids as their first pet. And I thought it's just such a good idea rather than getting Mm -hmm. someone, getting kids into an animal that could live 25 years. Who who the hell knows if they're going to want it next week (laughs) with, with an isopod, at least a, they're hardy. They're very easy to care for. And I'm not sure how long an isopod will live for, but, uh, but at least it's a little less of a commitment than something that's going to take them to college. Right. Uh, In terms of the individual isopods, certainly. And um, a colony can, could live indefinitely as long as you're, you're maintaining it properly. But um, yeah, as far as the individual isopods, you don't have to worry about that. And there are, there's one species of isopod in the hobby that can live to be about nine years old, but most of them it's, we're looking at two or three years. Right. Yeah. And then how, what are you, what are you putting in your display enclosures? Is it just like the sort of the classic, like a cork, cork bark and uh, leaf litter and whatnot? To some extent, but sometimes I try to um, mix it up, uh, make it a little bit more interesting. Like the, the uh, microbarium.com, when they send their display enclosures, they're always sending some botanical um, additions that are a little bit uh, fun, like a, a pod of some right. kind, maybe like a lotus pod or a monkey pod that you might find in a dart frog enclosure. And it gives a little more visual interest. Um, I'll also sometimes stack up um, the cork bark to make like little hills and give it some altitude. And certain species respond really well to that, like uh, Porcelio uh, flavo marginatus, for example, will will utilize all of that height if you build it. And others won't really use it. Uh, they want to stay right where it's hugging the ground. But uh, if you pick a species that will be out and about using it, then that that's a good thing to do. Yeah, they are such an industrious group of uh, of creatures. You know, one of the things that I notice in my gecko enclosures is if I do a really good job of uh, you know making sure there's leaf litter and whatnot on the in the on the base layer, I won't see them at all. But as soon as they run out of leaves, which is surprising how fast they'll eat a bunch of leaf litter. Like you'll go in there and you'll just see like the veins of leaves. But suddenly right. you will see them in the top, in the canopy, in the trees, and climbing up the branches and eating the gecko food, and and they'll just scavenge for anything. It's amazing. Right. And, and I think that is uh, an important thing to recognize. And I think it's uh, one of the failings that people hit upon or um, one of the mistakes people make when they start to, when they keep isopods, especially in a bioactive sort of situation, that um, they don't realize that when you get to a point where you're having isopods, they're thriving, there are plenty of leaf litter, there's plenty of you know, shed skin and, and uneaten food and um, fecal material and, and so on that they're eating. And then you uh, run out of one of those things for whatever reason. Then the isopods start getting a little bit more creative about what they eat. And people fail to realize that that is that critical point where you can start to run into problems. Like, right. oh, why is my vivarium now? It's, all these leaves are stripped off the plants and or, you know, things like that. Um, and it can just happen to do with that. Like if you're not maintaining the, the quantity of leaf litter and not that it's bad to, to know, oh, the leaf litter is getting a little low. I'm going to top it off. That's not a problem. But um, people who start out with a ton of leaf litter and then leave it for three months, you know, without any, and then they start running into problems and they wonder why. Exactly. It's always my cue to add more leaf litter when I see them up and around the top of the trees. It's, and it's funny because mm-hmm. the leaf litter disappears fast, but at the same time, it, you look at the enclosure every day, so you don't notice it. And then suddenly like, wow, there's actually no leaves in there. They've completely cleaned them out. So you hear like, you know, another pile. Right. I, I, just, just to stick on the display enclosures and just for a second, and this probably goes into other topics as well, just as far as the basic care, keeping them um what are some things that you're doing to make sure the that a a colony is thriving well one thing is and i think i sometimes belabor this point but you just make sure you provide a gradient for the ice pods in terms of uh, moisture Mm -hmm. um that's one that people mess up and it's important in display enclosures uh, very important to display enclosures because uh, sometimes the display enclosures have maybe more ventilation than some of the others and so they can dry out more quickly. So if you're not providing that gradient, you can run into problems very fast. Okay. So you're just misting a section and, and letting a section just basically stay totally dry? Yeah. And that does vary um, from species to species. And you, you kind of want a mid-range in there too. And making sure you have hides in the mid-range as well as the dry range. And in, in most cases, the, the moist side uh, provides enough hides itself because it's composed of, you know, piles of sphagnum moss. It's okay. You don't really have to do much there, but yeah, making sure there's hides in all those areas. 
And generally, I don't mist my isopods so much as I um, I water them. I usually use some kind of bottle that allows me to squirt a stream. Okay. Um, but like a thicker stream, like a ketchup bottle kind of stream. Or they're the um, eye irrigation bottles they sell for for medical you know, like first aid use where you have kind of a, a neck that has a 90 degree elbow in it and you can squirt. Um, I'll use that and so on because some isopods actually really hate being misted and can um, do very poorly when you mist. Some don't care at all, but um, some of the, the pickier ones that really like their moisture gradients really hate being misted and can be damaged. You can crash a culture that way. So I usually use something like that. Mm. And then as far as food, are you just mixing up just vegetables and, and whatnot? Well, I like to use, um, and you know, bears repeating just that uh, a big part of their food should be the leaf litter that goes in there. Right. Um, but as far as supplemental foods, um, I do give them bits of vegetables, uh, sweet potatoes, a favorite one of mine, um, carrots is another one, uh, any kind of squash, whether it's a summer squash, like a zucchini or, or a pumpkin style, or um, it's another one like, uh, that I use, uh, butternut squash, big one, um, things like that. And random bits of fruit like we have an apple tree uh and when we get a bumper crop of apple trees and they're i don't spray the tree at all so we'll get uh quite a few insects in the tree but i can cut up an apple that has insect damage and just cut out the insect part and give it to the, the isopods and things like yeah. that so i'll do things like that as well um i also use a lot of powdered food and a lot of pelleted fish food okay um pelleted fish food is great because it's got a lot of calcium and protein as well as a lot of other, you know, goodies in there for them. But I use a lot of uh, powdered food. I use Supreme Isopod Chow a lot. I find the isopods do really well on it. And one great thing about powder food, which relates back to the, the display enclosures we were talking about, if you give isopods pelleted food, generally, uh, unless the pellets are really huge in comparison to the isopods, they'll grab a pellet and run off and hide. Mm -hmm they want to stay away from the other ice pods that might take it and so you put a pile of food in there and the ice pods come and take it and that's cool but then they're all gone and the food's all gone if you put down a powdered food in a in a food dish or something like that you get all the ice pods coming they're just going to graze on it until it's gone and so you get a lot more visibility that way and, and what about um mixed species enclosures you kind of already touched on that with with the three that aren't hybridizing or don't seem, seem you know whether or not they're it's a mixed species enclosure i guess time will tell but Otherwise, is that something that you dabble in or is that kind of a no-no when it comes to, to mixing animals or mixing species? In general, I don't do it. Um, I do experiment with it, like with that uh, example with the rainbow mix, um, or cellular labels we talked about. Uh, I have another experimental enclosure that I'm working with right now, but I generally don't do it. And this is the reason why is because when I have done it accidentally, what tends to happen is one species does outcompete the other. Mm. And it varies very much which species you're favoring just because of competitive exclusion that if you have two different species, one of them is going to have an advantage in almost any given uh, set of circumstances. And so uh, over time, one of them is eventually going to get rid of the other. And I've seen it happen more than once. And um, because, and sometimes it takes years, mm. but it's like a, there's a slow battle of attrition and, you know, and one of them just finally loses out. Uh, and because I've seen it so many times, I don't recommend it. But I will also say that I know that the more complex the environment you make and the more niches you provide in that environment. So, so you get a really large enclosure and you have some fairly specific uh, micro habitats within that large habitat, the better chance you have of success. Have you mixed them with any other inverts? Uh, yeah. Yeah. I've played with that a little bit. Um, and I think generally because the isopods tend to have a different niche than that other invertebrate, it works better. Okay. Um, uh, of course, you can have issues with isopods eating um, molting individuals or especially mismolting individuals. That can be an issue for sure. Right. Uh, but I have experimented with that a little bit uh, in, in various capacities. One of them, right now I have some rubber ducky isopods with some Spirostreptus species one African millipedes. Okay. Um, and my reasoning behind that is that the, the millipede, um, frass, um, seems to be an attractive food for the isopods. Mm. And, um, I'm still experimenting with it. It seems to be going well so far. I'm not sure that it's a great thing to try to experiment with that. If you want maximal reproduction out of both, 
of the species involved. But things like that can be done. I know that I have Kyle Candillion of Roach Crossing puts isopods and roaches together in all sorts of combinations and has great success with it because the isopods tend to eat the molt and the uneaten food and the uh, frass of the, the roaches and do exceptionally well. Yeah. So I guess it's more of a trial and error thing. Sometimes it'll go probably hit the ditch fast and some other times it'll be okay. Right. And we, and it also depends so much on what else you're doing with that environment. So if you had two Asian forest scorpions in two different enclosures and you put the same species of isopods with both of them and you regularly topped off one with leaf litter and you didn't in the other one, you might find out that after a molt, one of them had been damaged and because you hadn't had enough leaf litter in there to keep them happy. And, and the other one with the leaf litter, they're totally fine after a molt. So I think there's things like that to keep in mind. People talk about isopods being more protein hungry than others and so on. But it seems like, um, based on conversations I've had with others like Kyle Candillion from Roach Crossing, that much of that may just be that the isopods weren't getting enough of what they needed. And as long as you're providing them with plentiful resources, they're not going to go out and look for um, other things to, to eat. And so they're but they will scavenge like, if you force them to. Yeah, yeah. And they'll even attack, uh, in certain conditions, they may attack uh, other living organisms if they're starving. Just like anything you could imagine. Right. So as far as colonies crashing, is, is the most common reason for a colony crashing, maybe let's say it's outside of a bioactive setup, is that mostly a moisture thing? That is a really, really common cause of crashing, yes. Uh, moisture, whether it's uh, usually not enough, but yeah. it can, can be too much too, because you can cause, uh, you know, a sodden substrate can cause all sorts of nasty things to happen from um, a really fast fungal bloom that will just... Um, fill the enclosure with carbon dioxide faster than it can diffuse out, ga gas them to death, basically. Um, right. It can also be um, some other things that can happen uh, independent of moisture. One of them that does happen is that people will have a colony that's really thriving and they don't realize that it's thriving partly because of what they're adding, but it's also exhausting the substrate and producing a lot of waste that mm -hmm. builds up in the substrate. And so you can get like ammonia buildup and um, isopods can, at least many types, can ex ex excrete ammonia as a gas, which is great. You can get rid of it pretty easily. It's not in necessarily ending up in the substrate. But if you have a big number of isopods and um, that they've just been building up and suddenly you get to the point where they're producing a critical quantity of ammonia, you can just gas your colony with ammonia. Right. So that can happen as well. Mm. Yeah, that, that makes sense. I know that happened to me with just the moisture, just letting them dry out. And then you open up the drawer and you're like, oh my God, half of them are dead because you just forgot for two days and it just happens quite fast. Right, right. And that is probably the most common thing that happens. As far as bioactive enclosures, w what are some species that you think are sort of the, the top of the list as far as being effective for, for being added into those enclosures? Whether Maybe we'll t start with tropical, but I'm also curious if you have some arid... Mm -hmm. Um, ideas as well. I think dwarf whites tend to be really good uh, because they're small enough that if you've got something like a dart frog uh, community, they're going to eat some of them, but they won't get all of them. And because they're parthenogenic, you don't have to have very many to get a colony going. Mm -hmm. uh, and so uh, if you do have a crash and just one survives, theoretically, you could start. You know, I never purchased dwarf whites. They all just showed up elsewhere and I began to raise them. So um, I looked at the mob. I said, what are these little white isopods? And I um, looked them up and identified them that way. I never bought them. So they can be really good that way in a, in a very moist enclosure. Uh, they're usually not going to damage anything. They're too small to damage most things. There are some invertebrates that I would uh, say they, they're not necessarily safe with. But in general, with most creatures, most amphibians, most reptiles are going to be safe. Um, and they do really well in the, the high moisture, high humidity, warmer temperatures. Another one that I really like uh, to use, and, and I do have you know, issues with dwarf whites in that uh, they can invade other cultures. They tend to do that. Mm -hmm. And especially since it only takes one and you might not notice if it's just one that's in there for months, but then suddenly, oh, there's you know, 300 in there and it's a problem. Yeah. So that, that can be an issue. But I like Porcelionides prunosis, the powder blue and all the color varieties. And there are lots of color varieties now of that species. Um, they are extremely versatile. 
they do well in moist enclosures. I do well in uh, like a temperate semi-arid. They do well in arid enclosures as long as they have a hydration station, you know, but they, they like warm temperatures. They do fine in cool temperatures. Um, the only thing that really seems to bother them is low ventilation. Mm. If the ventilation is really, really low, like dart frog level ventilation and where you're trying to maintain almost, you know, a maximal amount of humidity and minimal ventilation, they don't seem to do as well. But in just about any other setup, they, they do really well. They're, they're known for being a safe isopod. In other words, they're not known for being problematic and eating other creatures, attacking other creatures. Um, and they breed prolifically. They actually make a decent feeder and will tend to stand up to some predation pressure as long as they have enough hiding places and enough food and things like that. So if you have them with a lizard that eats them, as long as you establish them properly first, you probably don't have to worry that the, the lizard's going to eat all of them. Hmm. And, and, you know, there are a lot of factors there in enclosure size and how the density of the, the reptile population and so on in the enclosure, that kind of thing. But in general, they, they bounce back. They're super resilient. Uh, and they, they breed fast enough that they, they do a great job. Yeah, those that's the species that I have. I have dwarf whites as well, but I, I the powder blue I had that was part of the colony that crashed. I had, I think two left. <laughs> and from that, from those two or three individuals, I have like hundreds now, you know, they just very prolific and they do really yeah. well in the tropical gecko setups. And there's mm -hmm. just, there's tons of them. So, and it, it's so satisfying when you kind of dig through the soil and you just see them in there and you come in at nighttime with a flashlight and you see them ro roaming around. It just, you know, it, it's nice to see a good stable colony. Right. Right. And there is some evidence too, that um, isopods tend to react not only we talked about how they can learn to react to uh, light and or react less to light and just kind of be habituated to it. There's there's some evidence that they will react to predation pressure that uh, you can have isopods living in an enclosure with a predator that will tend to hide more than those that don't seem to have any predation pressure. And so um, you'll see them a lot more. Like uh, you're mentioning, you see that uh, you'll, your powder blues will hide in your gecko enclosures, but you dig around and you'll see them. But uh, I was in, and I've seen this in other enclosures of my own as well, but I was really impressed to see this in an insectarium that I visited. They had a, a bumblebee enclosure with um, flowers growing in it. It was, it was an acrylic enclosure, um, really bright LED lights on it to keep these flowers growing. So the bumblebees would be flying around and you know, pollinating the, the flowers and collecting nectar and whatnot. So people could come view it. They also had powder orange isopods in it. And they were crawling around everywhere because there were no predators in there and they were cleaning up the dead bees and they were cleaning up the dead plants and whatever. Uh, but they, they were not concerned about being out in this extremely bright light because one, they are habituated to it. And two, there was nothing that was going to prey on them. That's really fascinating. I mean, it's a lot more mental capacity than I think many people would, would put to an ice upon. Right. But there's, but it, it's, it's amazing that, you know, a being that small and that relatively simple can actually have that, you know, start to actually habituate to the fact that there's no predators or, or, you know, clue into the fact that there's no predators around. Right. It does seem really surprising. And, but they just, they're extraordinarily adaptable. Mm -hmm. We see how many different sorts of environments we put a lot of these species in and how well they adapt to all of them. There is such a wide variety of species. Do people use any of the more expensive ones in, in the bioactive setups or are those kind of just becoming like their own thing? Both, I think to a large extent, people just say, oh, that isopod cost me six bucks. I'm not going to put it in there. You know, yeah. just one. I'm not going to put it in with my lizard and see what happens. But I've heard of some people doing that with some of the species. Like they'll match a micro gecko with a really large isopod, knowing mm. that it's not going to eat any of the adults and it might pick off some of the young, but it's not going to be a big deal. Um, I've heard about that. Uh, and in some of the species uh, that started out being rather expensive, but turned out to be really prolific. People are using those as well, like the Cubaris species Panda King. Mm. Um, really cool looking species. And uh, when it first came into the hobby, it was you know, probably comparably priced to the rubber duckies. These days, because it reproduces so well, people are using it in bioactives. Yeah, that, that's pretty interesting. And then, it, so as far as the arid setups, because that's sort of the other side, and it's, there's always, everything's always tricky, trickier in arid setups as far as, you know, making the, the, you're trying to water plants, but keep things relatively dry. Is, are there some isopods that comes to your mind as well that would do well in, in a slightly drier setup? Yeah. And actually the, the Porcelanodes prunosus, the powder blues do well as long as they have plenty of area where they can hydrate. Right. Um, they'll do well in a, in a pretty arid environment, which is cool. Um, I kept them for years and with my uh, leopard gecko, uh, 
And as long as I maintained a, a moist corner, they were fine and did well and roamed all over the, the arid portions as well. So that, that can be a great species for that. Um, but if it does get too dry, you will lose them. And that, that's just, you know, something to keep in mind. And that basically means their, their moist area is allowed to dry out. Is, is, it doesn't matter if, you know, 75, 80% of the enclosure is dry as long as you have that one area. Uh, some other ones, same rule applies as far as a moist area goes, but uh, Porcelio dilatatus, the giant canyon, is an excellent ice pod for a wide variety of containers or enclosures, especially, uh, but works well in arid enclosures, partly because it can, um, it's fairly large and heavy bodied. And so it's not going to dry out as quickly as some others. And it will also burrow mm -hmm. and create a little microclimate that's moist. And so it has some resistance to desiccation behaviorally. And so that one works well. I have uh, that species in with uh, in a garter snake enclosure and they do fantastically well. They stay out of sight underground most of the time. They'll come out at night. And it's nice to see. I noticed that I had a, I have a sense of various snake plant in the, the enclosure. And they're really good about eating the, the dead leaves, but they'll leave the live leaves alone. Okay, cool. Uh, which is nice. Um, but it is a, it's a fairly arid enclosure and, and they do really well in there. Uh, another one that uh, I was thinking of does well in arid enclosures. Um, actually, dairy cows. Porcelia labus dairy cow can do really well in arid enclosures as long as it has that moist area. They're okay. they're more resistant than people think they are. People think of them as yeah, they're kind of a nice bud that likes the moisture, and it it does, but it's just super adaptable, so it likes that fine. But it'll also do well in a dry enclosure. A lot of people who do uh, bearded dragon bioactives will use that species, and some of them will get eaten, but it's not a big deal because they're extraordinarily prolific. Right. So it works out. And, and then, so speaking of of feeding, using them as feeders or them getting eaten while being in the bioactive enclosure, it, it's somewhat surprising that they aren't promoted as feeders more often. And, be, mm -hmm. you know, one of the questions that was from one of the, the, the patrons was talking about the, their calcium to phosphorus ratio is really incredible compared to like any other feeder. It was a 12 to one ratio. And on right. a good day, like a one to one ratio is really good for, for some feeders, you know, like a black soldier fly larvae and whatnot. So the fact that they have such a high calcium to phosphorus ratio and they're prolific and you have this wide variety of sizes. I mean, you know, I'll be at the, the, the large ones are probably too expensive to use as feeders right now, but it just seems like kind of bizarre that they're not more of a staple in the hobby. I agree. I, I really think they should be used more. And, um, years ago when I was raising my first crested gecko, um, isopods were a, a good part of his diet. Not the only thing he was eating, obviously, but, um, as far as live foods go, isopods were on the menu and it did really well uh with that and I, we still have that crested gecko and she's um older now and doesn't really care to eat bugs all that often but um at the time she was really into it when she was younger and i think that uh if i were to pick a species for um a feeder species it would be porcelain leva's dairy cow or milk back either one they're about the same as far as um the degree of uh prolific um, breeding and in terms of uh, size, I think the milk back is a little stockier, but other than that, they both are a fairly large isopod and just so extraordinarily prolific that you can use them as a feeder. Not in the same way you can breed fruit flies. You can't take, you know, 50 porcelain levis and put them in an enclosure and in two or three weeks you have 4,000. It's not going to happen the same <laughs> yeah. way. It's not even as fast as crickets or even um, many of the roaches, but still fast enough that you could have a few bins um, depending, you know, on the size of your collection of things that are going to eat them, what you're going to offer them to, you could have uh, three 16 quart bins and um, just rotate which one you're using to feed. You know, this week, these two weeks, I'm going to take some out of this bin. The next two weeks, I'm going to take some out of this bin and, and go through. And you could produce a pretty decent number of ice spots as long as you're feeding well and taking care of them. And just adding to the variety in the diet of whatever you happen to be feeding and, uh, like you say, the calcium ratio is pretty impressive. Um, and depending on what you're feeding them could also, you could bolster the nutrient profile if you're offering them things that contain omega-3 fatty acids like spirulina or flaxseed or, you know, things like that. You can help um, just boost their nutritional value that way as well. And, and just as far as feeder insects go, I just think some of the huge turnoffs with like crickets, for example, is the smell. Isopods don't have a smell and they're not escaping as much as crickets. And if they do, it's not like it's difficult to catch them. They're relatively slow. Like it just seems like 
there's so many benefits to them as far as using them as a feeder that it's kind of, I'm just surprised that people don't use them more often. Is there anything that comes to the top of your head as a reason that isn't ideal? I mean, I guess when I think about them as, you know, an, an animated feeder in an enclosure is probably not the best compared to something like a cricket jumping around, sort of triggering a feeding response for an animal. But is there anything that comes to your, your head? Well, I think there's a couple of, of issues at play. And one of them is just what I was mentioning before, about the breeding speed. Um, mm. you, can, you can have crickets um, go from egg to adulthood in a matter of a few weeks. Uh, and you can do the same with, you know, the fruit flies and mealworms and things like that, uh, that we, we raise there. The turnover of generations is just incredibly, you know, exponentially faster than, than most isopods. So you're just not going to be able to produce them in the, the sheer numbers. Um, so I think people don't think of them as a stable feeder that way, just because, you have to ded- dedicate a lot more space to producing the numbers you're going to need to right. produce 10,000 um, milk bags as opposed to producing 10,000 mealworms. The, the time, effort, and space required is going to be exponentially larger. Hmm. That doesn't mean they're not a, an excellent supplement that you shouldn't be using. It just means you're not going to be able to produce it in the bulk. Yeah. Um, and, and then the idea you mentioned about um, them not being maybe as visible, I think that's true of a lot of isopods. With things like dairy cows, they tend to be a lot less um, afraid and, and they're more bold and they're going to be out more. And that's a better species to use than, say, the Porcelio dilatatus as a feeder just because they're going to bury themselves. Yeah. Um, there's also the thing that you can leave mealworms or crickets in a deep walled feeding dish. You know, people will do that with some supplement or whatever for leopard geckos and leave them in the feeding dish. You can leave the mealworms there for two or three days and the mealworms are going to be fine. You leave uh, isopods there for an hour or two and they're going to be crispy. Right. Yes. So there are some issues there as well. Yeah. So it actually, they'll desiccate that quickly, hey? They, yeah, they desiccate extremely quickly. Uh, yeah. It can be uh, less than an hour, depending on the humidity. Uh, in the room, even fairly high humidity, they're still going to desiccate fairly quickly. Generally, if they're just on a like an impermeable surface, I guess it makes sense. They are essentially an aquatic animal that just <laughs> finds aquatic environments on the land. Right. Essentially, yeah. So it, it doesn't take long at all. Mm-hmm. Um, and even the more uh, resistant isopods, like the really extraordinarily desert adapted isopods uh, that we know of, like the Hemilopistes genus. Most of that adaptation, some of it is probably physiological, but most of it's behavioral. They build a microclimate. They build a, a burrow that they line with material that keeps them from desiccating while they're in that burrow. Interesting. So there's like a sort of an innate behavior to make sure they're not losing that moisture rather than just being able to handle a dry environment better. Right. As far as breeding goes and, and making sure they are, you do have a prolific colony is there anything specific that that you do to make sure that happens or you know that you see people making mistakes as far as trying to get a colony to 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 breed to breed yeah there are a couple of things um one of them is people often start with a number that's too small mm. you know they, they do a starter colony of uh six or ten or twelve that's not bad i mean you can do it i i kind of say don't do six six is not a great idea um, you can occasionally run into the issue where you only have uh, males or you only have, if you start out with really young ones, you could have females that never mated uh, right. if, if you just have six. If you start out with 12, you know, you're doubling your odds and that's good. Um, but if you start with a bigger number, you can, you can have a reproducing colony so much faster. I mean, go ahead and spring for 50, 60, 100 if you can, especially of the cheaper isopods. And they'll be breeding so fast that you won't even have to worry about it. That's, that's one thing. If, if you want to get numbers fast, just start out with a bigger number. Um, it's partly because of um, the way that isopods behavior works. They have some pretty interesting and complex social interactions, if you want to call them that. Um, isopods produce aggregating pheromones. And so if you have isopods in one area, uh, they, you have two or three isopods, say you put... Um, 50 into a bin and um, two or three of them find a nice hiding place. They're going to start producing that, that pheromone and others are going to start gathering to that same place. And probably noticed whenever you put ice buds in a new enclosure, at first they just kind of wander around aimlessly. But after a little while, you start noticing that they're in these certain spots. And that's partly due to the fact that the spots are probably a good spot for them to be, but it's speeded up or sped up by the fact that they have these, uh, 
hormones or pheromones, I keep saying hormones, I mean to say pheromones, that are attracting them to that spot. Mm. It's basically a signal to the others, but hey, we found a really cool place to hang out, come hang out with us. And then they're more likely to breed because they can interact with each other. And so that sort of speeds up the whole process. And as far as the reproductive cycle, can, can you run through that just, just briefly as, you know, how long it takes and, and sort of the stages of, of development? Um, I suppose start, I guess I just have to pick a spot to start. They, um, when the, the female is fertilized, um, she deposits eggs into a pouch mm. that is formed of plates and the plates are called oostegites and um, it, together and it, as a structure, they're called a marsupium, a pouch. And the eggs are in there in a very moist environment and they develop over the process of several weeks and that uh, how long that exactly takes uh, depends on the species and so on. And, um, and she, she's carrying that around, right? That's on, on, on her belly. Right, that's on her belly, attached to her belly. Basically the pouch, pouch is part of her body. And um, once she gets to a certain point, um, she will release the offspring. And it appears that some species, in some species, she might release the offspring. And they might actually go back into the pouch uh, for a short period of time and then come back out. There is some parental care in isopods and it varies widely in species. Some of the females will protect the young for long periods of time, several days, maybe several weeks, and some even longer. Uh, the, that desert species, the Hemilipistes reamuri that I mentioned before, it appears that the male and female will actually take turns foraging and then protecting the young and, and bringing incredible. food back for the young and different things. So, um, But many species just sort of, they come out of the pouch and they're gone and that's it and they're done. They go fend for themselves. And a lot of the ones in the hobby are like that, but um, some do exhibit some parental care. Um, and then when they come, when they hatch, which is not really, you know, they are hatching from eggs, but they're coming from the pouch. So it's ba basically oval viviparity, like we see in some reptiles where the eggs are hatching at the time they leave the mother, essentially. Um, and so it's somewhere between live birth and, and egg laying. But anyway, right. uh, these, these young are very typically transparent, very susceptible to moisture loss because of their surface area to mass ratio and so on. Um, and so they generally hide under the substrate or in other places that are very moist. They need a moisture environment than their parents do typically. And you give them a few weeks and they're molting and so on. The, the first, when they first emerge, they're called a manca because they're, they're missing. Uh, mancare from Latin means to miss or to lack something. And so they're lacking a pair of legs. They're lacking a section of their body and a pair of legs. And, Hopefully I'm saying that right, but basically that's how something like that is how it works. And um, they molt very soon afterwards and gain that extra segment of their body. And now, to be honest, I can't remember if it, it either equates to a pair of legs or not, but it is a body segment they're missing. And then they molt and they have it. And so they're not correctly called mankai once they molt. So that only that first instar basically mm -hmm. is correctly called a manka. But people often use the term to refer to just young isopods. Um, at any rate, they, they start developing when they're about a third of the size, and that varies by species, but about the third of the size of the adults, they become sexually mature and start breeding. Wow. Unlike many other, you know, arthropods we think of, they have, here's their mature molt, and they, they reach this stage, and now they, they're very different. Um, isopods don't do that. They can reproduce very young, which is another thing that uh, leads to their success, I think, and, and the prolific nature of many of them, because you can have these tiny ice pods producing babies and they just keep producing as they get older and older. Th that is an incredibly bizarre uh, uh, evolutionary adaptation when you think about how strange that is for an animal to hit sexual maturity before it's hit its full growth. That, that's just so strange to think about. It's like imagining, you know, a small animal reproducing before and then still having another, you know, a tripling of its own size and then continue to do that along the way. That's insane. Right. It is. It's, it's a really unusual um, sort of way of going about things, but it seems to work for them. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. So, yeah. so if a female is only half the size of her full grown counterpart and she's mm -hmm. giving birth to, uh, how, like, are, are the actual babies still... I guess the, the original, like the, the very first hatchling, we'll call it, is very, very small. It's just, it's, it's not like it's even smaller when it's coming off of a female that's only the third of a size of a full-grown adult, adult. Yeah, I think mostly what uh, is affected is the brood size in that case. Okay, okay, that makes sense. To a large extent. And there may be some other things going on as well, but 
it's mostly just the brood size. Yeah. But still, it allows them to to replicate quite quickly. One one thing I did not ask you about, but as you were talking, maybe think about it was temperature. Are you monitoring temperature at all through any of your colonies, or do you just is room temperature seeming seeming fine? Um, room temperature seems to be fine for most. I think there are some species that are more sensitive to warm temperatures, you know, in a bad way. Some of them are more sensitive to cooler temperatures. So I do try to be sensitive to that. Uh, and with the tropical species, for example, you don't want to get too cool, but generally in a house, you know, you're not going to end up with temperatures that are too cool. I think it does uh, affect the breeding speed of some of them. And in some cases you'll find, oh, this species, when it gets cooled off in the winter, that's when it really starts breeding. And with right. other species, it might slow down quite a bit when it's cooler, if it's a more tropical species. Some don't seem particularly affected by the temperature range differences that I experience in my house. Um, I'm going to say it in Fahrenheit because that's what I'm used to, but um, around 68 Fahrenheit is the minimum I get in the winter in my critter room. And uh, in the summer, it's about 78. Okay. Uh, so that's that's about the range that they get. And I notice some species like the rubber duck, you seem to reproduce better when it's warmer. Which makes you don't use any supplemental species. heat or anything. But I don't have running off heat temperature. mats or anything like that. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I just, unless the uh, ice buds happen to be in a bioactive enclosure with their supplemental heat, like my garter snakes have a basking lamp on you know the warm side of the enclosure and the ice pods conceivably could be uh, benefiting from the temperature gradient as well. But in cases, just normal ice spot enclosures, I don't do that. Mm. And, and so when you use them in the bioactive enclosures, are you, you're just making sure, and we kind of already touched on this, but I just want to make sure it's clear, as far as feeding the isopods, you're, you're just making sure there's enough leaf litter in there and and then you, you might supplementally feed, feed them and whatnot. But just to make sure that colony is healthy, is that just standard practice is just the leaf litter? Mostly, but if it just depends. I keep an eye on the the culture and how it seems to be doing in a bioactive enclosure. And um, I think, well, for example, right now I have some snakes in brumation in my garage in a, in a brumation chamber, you know, thermostatically controlled in there. And because I have that, uh, the snakes are not in their bioactive enclosures right now. I don't want to just leave those uh, isopods with nothing but leaf litter because they're used to sheds and they're used to, you know, potentially waste and and small portions of food that, you know, fall off if they eat an earthworm and drop a piece or whatever when they're um, eating it, because sometimes they'll do that uh, with garter snakes. Um, The food is probably not enough to just say, okay, there's leaf litter in there, I'm going to be fine. So I will put other things in there, uh, fish food pellets or just ice pod powdered food or different things, and I'll watch them come and eat it. And then I know that instead of having kind of a meager population that has been used to months of nothing but leaf litter, when I put the snakes in and I want them to start eating snake poop and, you know, uh, shed skins or whatever, um, I'm going to have a robust population that is used to eating uh, leaf litter with uh, some supplementation. So they're, they're going to be doing better. And I I don't want to make that population so big that they're going to be starving and maybe attempt to swarm the snakes or something, but, um, and I've never seen that happen, but you know, I don't want to push my luck, but I do want to make sure that the population is robust enough to handle and process some waste. Do you spot clean those garter snake enclosures or do you let the isopods take care of all the waste? I do have to spot clean some and it depends on a lot on the the load of snakes that's in the enclosure and it depends on the the setup in various ways and how many isopods are in there. You know, obviously the more isopods, the less I have to spot clean. But uh, generally when the snakes will um, defecate on a drier area, the isopods tend to leave it alone. So right. like um, maybe the top of their basking spot's not going to cleaned at all really. And so I'll have to take, you know, the cork bark out and rinse that off and put it back in that kind of thing. And then um, urates don't get eaten nearly as much as um, the other, you know, the actual feces do. And so I have to deal with that too. Right. Yeah. I, and that's where a lot of people will say, oh, I don't like to go bioactive with my snakes because they do produce a lot of waste. Although with a garter snake, it's a lot, you know, you're dealing with a very small animal. So you could probably get away with a lot of the, the isopods cleaning up the waste. If you're dealing with something like a boa or something where the feces is just a lot, <laughs> you could never have isopods yeah. kind of take care of that unless you have a massive enclosure. Right. And it would be more, you you clean up and whatever is left over, the isopods can process. But yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. But with garter snakes, they do a really pretty good job as long as it's in a spot where the isopods are going to access it. And um, like I said, uh, you're right. Sometimes I have to just take care of it anyway. Well, and one thing I, I know of people who have very thriving bioactive and uh, bioactive enclosures with isopods is how quickly the shed skins just disappear. Yeah. 
yeah, it's it is fantastic to watch, and especially when I have a a shed, because a lot of times with my baby garter snakes when they're they're neonates, I will take I will put them in a in a simpler container with paper towels and so on for a little while, um, and then when they do shed, I'll just take that shed out. And isopods really seem to like the the newly uh, the neonate sheds the best, especially when they're fresh. But yeah. even if they're not fresh, the neonate sheds they'll eat the entire thing. Um, a lot of times with the larger sheds, they won't touch the belly scoots or they'll take a long time to go through the belly scoots of a snake shed. Um, but with a neonate shed, it's just, I, I need to do more time lapses. I have done time lapse once or twice with snake shed, but I should do a neonate one because it's so fast. It's incredible how fast they'll eat it and yeah. entirely. Yeah, that is incredible. So as far as the other species that you're keeping, I mean, we went through isopods. Is there anything about isopods that we left out that you think is worth people knowing? I think we covered a lot. I think we did. We Did we answer that question? You were saying your your, your patron had a question about something. Uh, yeah, we, that was about that? the feeders. Yeah, yeah. You mentioned a couple of good okay. options there. Yeah. Okay. So I think other than that, we probably hit everything we wanted to talk about. As, as far as the other things you're keeping, you mentioned the garter snakes and whatnot. Um, mm-hmm. uh, is there anything that you're keeping right now that you think, because you, you sort of have a, uh, an eclectic collection in a way, like you keep uh, somewhat unusual things. Is there anything in there that you think there should, this should be more popular than it is? I guess I've already mentioned garter snakes, but I think they should be more popular. I, I think they are underrated for some they, reason. They are. People don't realize. And a lot of people ask me, they're like, Russ, why garter snakes? Seriously, I can go in my backyard and catch one. And I tell them, oh, I can go out in my backyard and catch one too, but that's not what I do. I keep some of the fantastically colored ones, like the melanistics that I have or the, the red sided that, you know, live up into Canada and so on. And they have some populations that are really intensely colored. Um, but it's not just that. It's the fact that garter snakes are, one, diurnal. And right. so you're going to see a lot of activity. Um, two, communal. So you see a lot of interactivity. Um, three, they tend to be genuinely curious about humans. Um, and people will say to me, people who are uninitiated about reptiles, are like, a snake, is it going to show any interest in you at all? How can you tell, you know... It's just going to sit there. And I say, no, when I open the enclosure, those snakes are excited about something. And, and then people say, oh, just because they're going to get fed? I say, well, no, because obviously they, they have a very strong feeding response. And that, that's something to be said for that. But the snakes often will just climb right up onto my arm. And I will try to feed them like, no, I'm not interested in food. I yeah. just wanted to just come out. And this is fun. They, they get some sort of reinforcement from interacting with you, whether it's Oh, this is just a different thing. And I get to crawl in this warm human. If that's what it is, that's what it is. But I tend to feel like there's something else going on. And um, they've done the research with garter snakes. Garter snakes develop bonds with other individuals. And it's not too far of a stretch to think they might form some of those bonds with a human too. Yeah, I think there's a lot of misconceptions as far as how far intelligence goes in snakes and reptiles. And, and I right. think we just sort of wrongly assume that there's not a lot going on there when there probably is. And especially when you're dealing with something like a garter snake that are very social, like you said, they're very social in the wild. I mean, I live in Manitoba, so we have this, you know, the, the famous Narciss snake pits with the red sided garter snakes. And there's just like tens of thousands of these things that gather every year. And it's a really remarkable thing. And, and even just seeing them I, I see them all the time because we do have so many in the province. They're such a versatile species as well. They are incredible swimmers. They're, they're climbers. They're they're in you know in the grass and they they do seem like a very fun species to keep. And I people who who I know who have kept them in the past have reported similar things that you're saying is they have this like very interactive bond with the keeper, which is something that not a lot of snakes exhibit all the time. And they they are gaining popularity. They're a lot more popular than they were a few years ago, but. I, I just seriously think they are underrated. And I have, we also have a corn snake and I love our corn snake, but uh, the level of interaction is, is a, it's a different level. What, what are the melanistic garter snakes? What species is that? It is the uh, Eastern Thamnophis sertalis sertalis. Okay. And is that, is that just a naturally occurring color mutation or is that somebody's worked on that? It's, it's pretty fascinating. Apparently uh, this, uh, it's kind of a lo- sort of a locality because in the uh, northern parts of its range, up into places like uh, Michigan, for example, um, and other Great Lakes areas, it uh, there's a large or a high incidence of melanism because they live in such cool areas. It it's a thermal advantage to be able to go out in the sun for just to throw out a number like 
five minutes rather than 15 and warm, warm up effectively. And so the incidence of melanistics in that area is high, um, but people have taken it and it does, it does breed true. It's a recessive trait. And so people have kind of made a morph out of it, but it's really sort of a, an example of taking a locality with a high incidence and then um, selectively breeding that trait. Yeah, they are really neat looking, and and that and that's the other thing too that I, I didn't mention about them is this, this how like oh, I live in Manitoba today when I woke up it was minus thirty two degrees Celsius, and I know that there's a whole bunch of garter snakes somewhere in this province <laughs> that are just hunkering down for the winter. Of course, in their hibernaculum, it's not getting that cold, but they're right. still dealing with incredibly harsh prairie like Canadian prairie winters, and they're. And then the the seasons are short, you know, they, they come up in the spring and the summer and it's a short season, they get down to business and they, they come back in. So it's just, it's amazing that they can survive such in, incredible conditions. It is. And I've, I've read uh, some, some papers on the, the adaptability of red-sided garter snakes uh, specifically. And it's fascinating that red-sided garter snakes, because they, they venture so far North have some incredible adaptations to uh, freezing that, a garter snake can actually go to temperatures below freezing and many times recover from that. Mm-hmm. And most reptiles, once they, you know, reach that temperature, that's it. They have to, uh, they're, they're, they're dead. That's it. Yeah. But they, I think the mortality rate was only something like 50% for wow. those snakes. And they, they think the adaptation is not so much to, um, being able to freeze solid for very long periods of time, like in a hibernaculum, they, that would kill them if they're dead, you know, they're frozen that long, but they're just dead. But that uh, because they live in such an extreme environment, there are times when they think they're, they should be awake and they're out of the hibernaculum and they might reach those temperatures for a few hours and then come back up. And the, enough of them will survive that sort of situation to be able to you know, bring the next generation along. Yeah. Yeah, it's pretty remarkable, actually. So hopefully that's a species that, that that starts to gain a little more popularity. And the listeners will be rolling their eyes when I say this, but I, I, I'm just getting into the habit of promoting smaller species as much as possible. And I just think it's because it's, you can do so much more with them, and, and especially if they're communal and you can cohabitate them as, as well. That's amazing. But just I think it's just a lot easier to care for smaller species. And that's a great small species that people definitely don't think about enough. It's true. And, and one nice thing that I tell people too with garters is that you can choose your size range even within a species because if you want a, a smaller one, if you only have, a say, a 20-gallon tank and you want uh, a garter or two, get a couple of males Yeah, and, and you can have them in a 20-gallon tank and they're okay. It's, it would be better to give them more space, but it's, it's not going to be a terrible thing for them to be in a 20-gallon. If, if you want slightly bigger snakes, well, considerably bigger snakes that are, you know, three or four times the mass or even more, then get females and get a larger tank. Yeah. But you can kind of pick what you want. Yeah, they are incredibly sexually dimorphic when it comes to size. The females mm-hmm. are like shockingly big when you see them because I think most people are used to seeing males in the wild. You see them scurrying around in the grass and whatnot. And then once in a while, you see a female that's like basking on a rock. And you're like, oh my God, it barely looks <laughs> yeah. like a garter snake that gets so big. Right. Like uh, my female red-sided, uh, she is a little bigger than average for a species. She's not like the giant of the, you know, she's not in the Guinness Book of World Records or anything, but she's 40 inches long, which is decent for a garter yeah. snake and, and decent for her species, especially. Um, and far thicker than my thumb. Mm-hmm. And then the, the two males I have are about uh, 24 inches long. Or, no, they're, they're maybe a little longer than that. But as far as girth goes, they're like my pinky finger. Yeah. If that, you know, they, there's a lot of difference. Yeah, yeah, they are. They are a really interesting species. Is there anything else you keep otherwise, like reptiles or, or invert wise, that you think that uh, should be kept more, or something that you're just totally fascinated by? Yeah, there's actually a lot of things. Um, one, <laughs> <laughs> one uh, harvestmen or opigiones. Um, they're a really interesting communal arachnid. People think of arachnids as being mostly solitary predators. And many of them are, some of them are communal predators, but uh, harvestmen are interesting because they are communal, but at least many of them are, but they can also be detritivores. Mm. So they're eating vegetable matter. They're eating uh, dead, dead animal matter and things like that. And much of their diet can consist of that. Uh, and they, they're sort of an otherworldly alien-like creature. Many of them fluoresce, something like a scorpion does. But they're uh, super easy to take care of. Basically, you can take care of them like isopods that are with, and just change the protein balance a little bit. 
How large are they? And it, the, the size varies widely. There are a lot of them out there. Uh, the species that I keep, uh, their bodies are probably only smaller than half a centimeter. Um, oh, okay, their bodies. Small. But then they have uh, their leg span is bigger. So, um, you know, they could sit uh, on top of the pad of my thumb, maybe, and mostly cover it with their legs. Right. Uh, but um, there are larger species out there. Uh, there are many tropical species that I think are going to start making their way into the hobby. Um, because they are fascinating armor and colors and they have spikes going down their backs or, you know, they look almost like alien crabs and different things like that. I think people will be uh, keeping more of them in the future. Yeah. The, I mean, the, the, when you get into the invert world, there is a massive sea of species that people haven't even seen, let alone end up keeping, you know, in the, in the private trade. So just imagine how many options there eventually will be. Right. I think that's, uh, that's going to go nuts. Uh, eventually another one i think is some of the more uh unusual native species of phytopus um jumping spiders mm. jumping spiders are kind of really gaining in popularity they are but most, yeah. most of the ones that are it's mostly phytopus regius or regius um the south the species from the southeastern united states like florida and, and neighboring states um, that's a great one. And they're really large and, and they're beautiful and so on. Um, I have nothing bad to say about that species and I've kept it and I love it. But we have a lot of native species out in the West that have really vivid uh, like red coloration. Some of them seem to be mimics of velvet ants. Mm. And they are just as easy to keep and maybe easier because they don't have as, uh, um, they don't have as much of a need for humidity because they come from Southwest desert areas. And right, I, right. I have one that I got recently. It's still a young one, but it is an absolutely gorgeous red color with like a black stripe down the middle and they get to a comparable size uh, and just as friendly, maybe even more friendly. And so I think some of these uh, other species of Phytopus that are really not very popular in hobby need to become more popular. Yeah, absolutely. Well, why don't we spend a little bit of time as we wrap up here, just talking about your YouTube channel. You can let, let us know. I mean, I know lots of people are already familiar with your channel and they already watch your videos and you know, that's why you were recommended as a guest, but for someone that's not familiar with it, can you just let people know what they can expect if they tune in? Yeah. Yeah. Well, my channel is called Aquarium X Pets. And what I always say in my videos is it's about aquarium and vivarium pets. So anything you could keep in an aquarium or vivarium, which opens it up to lots of different things. And so, um, I do have a lot of arthropod content with isopods being the focus of that arthropod content, but I have everything from tailless whip scorpions to, uh, true scorpions and pseudoscorpions to millipedes and, uh, beetles of various types. Um, I keep, uh, like a Southwest desert set up with various um, beetles from that part of the world. Um, and so I keep all different kinds of arthropods included in that are the live foods. I have a lot of video on live food cultures from crickets and mealworms and superworms to aquatic live foods like Daphnia and amphipods and uh, things like that. Um, I also do a lot with uh, reptiles, especially my snakes and mm -hmm. the geckos and things like that that I keep. Uh, and I also like to do live streams. So I do a lot of care guides, uh, about the species that I keep. And I feel like I don't do a care guide until I've had, I've been in the trenches with a species, you know, right. You, you see some, some people, and I'm not trying to judge, but I'm just saying, if you've kept something for three weeks, you probably shouldn't be putting a care guide out. <laughs> yeah. I and, agree. And we see that, but, um, if I've been in the trenches with an animal for a while and I feel like I've got a handle on its husbandry, then, then I will put out a care guide for it. Um, but I also do live streams with people who keep something that I don't keep. And so that we can get their in-depth knowledge. They've been keeping something for six years and are having a lot of success with it. And I'll talk with them about that and uh, get some insights into things that either I, I've never kept or maybe they've kept a lot more than, than I have. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. I mean, I feel like if you've never had to troubleshoot an issue with a species, then you should not even be close to creating a care guide, right? Like if you, if you never run into a problem, you're like, I don't know what the deal is with this, or I, you know, maybe changing up the diet or changing temperatures or what, whatever it is, at least have a couple of those things, iterations of problems that you've had to solve with that species before you feel like you can just, uh, you know, read off the pet smart care guide. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. And there are some species of isopods that I've kept and I have not produced care guides of them. And some of them just because I haven't gotten around to it yet because there's a lot to get around to, but others are because I don't think I have a handle on this particular species yet. This yeah. species is giving me enough trouble that I want to wait until I have nailed down before I, I'm going to 
to a video on that. Yeah, but, I think that's the way to do it. And and you do live very consistent, right? Once a week? Typically, yeah. And they aren't always with a guest. Um, sometimes it's just, I'm bringing out my collection. I'm saying, here are the projects I'm working on. What do you guys think? And and it can be requests. Like sometimes patrons will say, I want to see these species and how you're keeping them and whatever. And I'll do that. Uh, and sometimes it's just sort of off the cuff. I'll just stand in front of the camera and answer questions. Um, yeah. But I do try to do a guest roughly once a month. And sometimes cool. it's more, sometimes it's not that often, but I do try to do that. Awesome. Well, it's a great channel. I know, congrats, you just recently hit 60,000 subscribers, which is Thank incredible. I, I love seeing channels like yours, like, you know, build the momentum. It's not a guy running around with a camera trying to, you know, hold attention by talking in a strange way, <laughs> you know, <laughs> you know, all this like glamorous stuff that we see now. It's just, you know, to the point, information is really solid and it's entertaining because it's information that we all want. So great job with that. And Thank you. And I've, I've really enjoyed this conversation. Yeah, I think you are a wealth of knowledge. I'm sure you could talk about isopods and everything else for, for hours on end. So I'll, I'll let people go tune into your channel to, to you know, gather the rest of that information. Is awesome. there anything we left out tonight, Russ, that you wanted to mention before we, we wrap up? Let's see. Well, um, I did want to thank you for having me. It's been awesome. I've enjoyed talking to you as well. Um, trying to think if there's anything else. I guess everybody knows where to find me. Um, yeah, yeah. Please, please, please plug uh, where, where they can find you. As well as Aquarium X Pets on YouTube, uh, my most active other social media social medium is uh, Instagram. Just um, hashtag Aquarium X Pets. Uh, I, I don't have near as many followers on there, but I do have a decent following there, and uh, I enjoy posting things that are related to what I'm doing on my channel, and some things that that are not. Um, they're all critters. They're all creatures. But sometimes I'll post something on my Instagram that you won't see on my YouTube, for example, just to keep it more fun, more interesting. So yeah, yeah, it's good to do that as well, I guess. Awesome. Well, Russ, I really appreciate you spending the, the hour and a half here with me tonight. It was a great conversation. Thank you so much for, for being a guest. And we'll have to have you on again in the future at some point. Well, thank you. I would love to come back. All right. That is the end of that episode. Russ, thank you so much for jumping on an episode. I had a blast chatting with you. You are an incredible wealth of knowledge when it comes to isopods. And I hope that all the listeners found that absolutely intriguing. I'm sure they did. And to the listeners, if you want more isopod content, and if you're just eager to learn more, head to Aquarium Max Pets on YouTube. There's so much more that Russ has on there. It's just really a catalog of information. And uh, you will find yourself watching these videos for hours, learning more. And it really does make me want to you know, I have isopods, obviously, in my bioactive setups, but I'm kind of wondering if it would be pretty cool to have some of the larger species in a small display enclosure. And I know in, in Manitoba, there's Species Canada. For those of you who are in Canada looking for some incredible isopods, uh, Cheyenne and Ivan over at Species Canada have incredible collection. And whenever I go to the expos, I see these larger species. And now after talking to Russ, it really does make me want to potentially set up a display enclosure for them. So anyway... Thank you so much for listening. If you are interested in supporting the podcast financially, you can do that over at patreon.com slash animals at home. If you're looking for more information on this podcast, make sure you head to animals at home network.com. Thank you so much to Custom Reptile Habitats for sponsoring this podcast. And if you want to help support the show, just share it on Instagram and Facebook. That is a huge benefit. And I will catch you guys in the next episode.